Hello and welcome back to Graphics Wizardry with me, Phil Smith. We're going to be doing um, a little bit on context today. On Friday session with the students, I did a session about um, putting your artwork and your sketches and gadgets and devices and whatever into context. And I'm going to go through a particular technique that I ran through in that session, which is a, a way of doing realistic shadows to properly sort of ground the work that you're doing and, uh, and sort of sit it on the page rather than it's just sort of floating there now that we're going to sort of add a drop shadow and we're not going to do the drop shadow that Photoshop wants you to do though because that's a really horrible drop shadow it's got absolutely that's the default drop shadow it looks awful and it doesn't it's it it replicates the uh, appearance of a sticker rather than a physical object in three-dimensional space so we're gonna have to sort of sort of make it up as we go along and make our own shadow and so I'll show you guys how to do that I've got this as a a layer like this so you can flatten your artwork down on a copy not on the original god god no and then work on this. I've got a white background just so this is a bit easier to see exactly what I'm doing. So I'm going to use the polygonal lasso tool here. And the first thing to do is to visualize the shape of the area of the object that is in contact with the ground. So in this case it's not flat just here. Let me just select that. So it's more or less like this. It doesn't have to be super perfect and accurate with what you're doing here. And you'll notice that I'm not selecting close up on the front because that, um, look, just trust me, I will, you'll see in a second why not. This bit isn't particularly important, but I'm just in the interest of completion, I'm doing it. So if I can press Control C, Control V now, this is why I wasn't being careful about the, the front of this because it inherits from the selected area. So that's more or less the shape of the area that's in contact with the ground. This back bit's not really important at all. Let me just rename that Shadow 1, and it's one of a number of shadows that we're going to be making. So obviously the shadow is going to go underneath the artwork layer. I'm going to lock the transparency and fill with black. So I've got black as the foreground colour. Press Alt, backspace, fill with black. I'm just going to jig this into place just here. Instantly you get some information about the uh, the shape of the object being added. If this is completely flush with the bottom then that means that the base of the object is in contact with the with the ground. If you shuffle it down like that, that means that there are unseen feet or some kind of protrusion underneath which is separating it and the closer the shadow is the smaller those feet are. So I'm going to go around, I don't know, I guess I'll go around about there, I haven't really thought about it very much. So I've unlocked the transparency and I'm going to go to blur, Gaussian blur. I'm going to go with Gaussian blur rather than Gaussian blur for no real reason, but I might as well pick one and stick with it, so at least I'm consistent. Gaussian blur is just like a sort of a normal blur, but it gives you the option to specify a radius for the blur, down to ridiculously like a tenth of a pixel in terms of what the diameter for the radius is. I'm going to go to 2.1, 2.2, why not? Let's be ridiculously specific. And what we're going to do is to build a multi-part, a multi-part shadow. Now there's a number of different ways that I could accomplish this. And um, I'm going to pick sort of the cheaty quick way. Um, what I'm going to try and do is to produce a three-phase shadow which is wider at the side than it is at the front so that I can sort of simulate the foreshortening effect that we'll expect to see on this floor surface here for a diffuse shadow. Obviously if I, I could just put a, a larger Gaussian blur on here. The problem with this is, if I put a big Gaussian blur on, that it's, it's as broad at the bottom as it is on the side and it actually looks much more pronounced because this is a like a thinner area to blur out. And that's not the way that the shadow would work because it's on a angled surface, so it's going to be foreshortened. So the side is going to be wider than the front on the shadow. So I've just duplicated that, so I'm going to call this shadow one. Shadow shadow two, rather shadow one is going to stay this very narrow shadow just here. Shadow two. What I'm going to do first is go to blur motion blur. 
set the angle to zero, and this is going to sort of horizontally blur out the shadow. And what that does is that gives us the sort of horizontal protrusion that we're looking for to create the added illusion of foreshortening. And then the problem with this is you'll notice that you get this very mechanical, you know, mechanical shadow and a very weird effect just here, which is not what we want. So just to soften that out, I'm going to put a Gaussian blur on it. So you see now it's wider at the side than it is at the front. Let's duplicate that again. Add some more motion blur in. Much bigger this time. And we're going to go with a much wider blur as well. Put a Gaussian blur. duplicated that basically just to increase its density for the larger one. I'm going to reduce the opacity for the most narrow shadow as well slightly. Okay, so I'm, you know I'm pretty happy with that. You can see very quickly we've got this um, much more realistic shadow than if we just did a single stage shadow. So we've got shadow one, shadow two. This one should be shadow three, I guess. And in the interest of being it's sort of a shadow is a bit of anally retentive in terms of the organization here. Let's just fold that up. I can then turn the shadows on and off. Um, this one should be set to multiply actually, just to be really nerdy about it. So that was the first thing that I showed you guys. The thing about this is a very specific kind of shadow that we've done here, this kind of very diffuse shadow. <coughs> it's kind of like a, a replication of a shadow that you expect to see if an object has been photographed inside a sort of light booth. So I thought whilst we're reproducing that visual style, the light booth sort of style, we might as well reproduce the sort of very slight gradient that you'd expect to see in the background if this was a a sheet of backing paper that's been hung up with a curve at the back to reduce the lighting. So we're trying to sort of reproduce that photographic style as much as possible. Let's make a new layer. I'm going to call it gradient background. Click G to get the gradient tool up. The gradient that we want actually doesn't already exist, so I'm going to I'm going to make it. So to get the gradient editor, click on the actual gradient at the top here of the gradient tool. I'm just going to go in and start editing. Let's pick this one here. the colour that we want. So the gradient that we want is going to have a light grey at either end. And an off-centre darker grey just here. Look, you add in new colour stops just by clicking in the colour stop space underneath and then just drag them off if you don't want them. Or add and then click delete like this. Wonderful. I'm satisfied with that. Call that actual grey click new and it'll add it in just here. Now these can be accessed using the presets manager in exactly the same way as the brushes that we went through in the past and the swatches. So if you want this for a later project you can just save this and uh, use it as and when you desire. So on gradient background here, click at the bottom, hold down shift so that you don't end up with a wonky looking gradient. And then drag it up. So right, you know I reckon that looks pretty cool. So we've got this shade coming in, it adds a bit more sort of presence to the object as well, so it's almost like a very extended shadow that extends off the page. There's one more thing that I showed everybody, which was the way to do a, a, a reflection of the object underneath. Somebody said in session, why can't you just invert the object so that the reflection can be underneath? There's a reason why you can't do that. You could do it if you've just got a front-on picture of an iPad or something. But if you've not got a front-on picture of an iPad, if you're working on a piece of artwork like this, just to flip vertically, you end up with like an object that looks like this. There's no so simple way to you know, manipulate that into being the the, sh the reflection underneath. Because essentially, if you're looking at a reflection just here, you're kind of it's 
it's almost like a second object, say like a replica of the original object, but seen from a completely different perspective. So it's, there's no tr there's no trivial way with a, a flat illustration like this to invert and to, but there is a way of cheating. So I'm going to just cheat instead. You know that I'm a big fan of cheating. And what this does is it gives a sort of visual suggestion of a reflection, but without having to go to the trouble of actually doing a reflection. I've made a duplicate and it's underneath the other one. We'll set this to multiply as well. That's pretty important. I'll go to blur, motion blur. I'm going to use a, a vertical motion blur now. So 90. I could just have typed 90 in, couldn't I then, I guess? It's not been a great day. So I guess 250 is the right way for this. You can see this bit at the bottom here. This is essentially the reflection that we're looking for. But along with this, you get all of this noise up at the top. So it's nearly there, but it looks a bit wonky. This is too much. So I'm going to just click on the add layer mask here. And a big hard brush here. I'm going to make sure that I'm painting with black on the layer mask. And I can just paint out the bits that I don't want. And what I'm going to do, in fact, just to harden this edge up here, is I'm going to click here, hold down shift and click down at the bottom. I'll do the same over here. Mm, didn't really work that one. Whatever, looks fine. I can reduce the opacity of that down a little bit. Maybe turn this down a little bit as well. So, very quickly, we've been going for about 10 minutes. We've gone from this. It's, it pops, you know, the silhouette is very clear. But it doesn't feel locked down into three-dimensional space. Add these in. And we've essentially created this sort of artificial environment for this object to come into. This very realistic, physical sort of looking shadow. We've hinted at, using a really budget technique, this vertical reflection here. So I'm satisfied with that. I think that looks pretty cool. And, um, and it's a technique that, you, you know, you guys can experiment with. Certainly out of this, this uh, the shadow I would say is perhaps the most useful. It's applicable to lots of different things. That idea of visualizing the um, area that's in contact with the ground and then using the shadow to almost almost hint at that is interesting and useful and applicable. So I hope you guys found that useful and um, I will see you soon. If you have any questions, ask them in the comments down below. Please do subscribe and then you'll get notifications every time I release one of these videos. I'm gonna try and do a few more little teeny tiny short ones like this and if um, you are one of the people who attends my sessions on Thursdays or Fridays I'll see you in the session on Thursday or Friday and uh, I hope you guys have a really nice weekend or week or do you know whatever just don't or do I don't mind bye